certainly first visit uh, under his presidentship. I am uh, really glad to see what Advaita Ashram you know, is. I have always spoken about it sometimes in my talks, Mayavati. I was just telling Maharaj, it seems to have become even more beautiful and it's not just my personal uh, opinion, others have also said that. So, this is an extraordinary setting. I have been teaching Vedanta for quite some time, uh, for several years now. But this is the most appropriate setting for teaching Vedanta. This was made by Swami Vivekananda just for this purpose. And Maharaj is focusing very sharply, is focusing attention on uh, the study and teaching of Advaita Vedanta, part of which are these retreats, and this retreat is one of one such retreat. All right. So what I intend to do in the next half an hour, this clock is accurate, right? Yes, so in the next twenty-five minutes or so, I'll just give us the big picture of this retreat, what we are uh, going to study. What's the background of all of this? Um, we know that we are going to study this book, Drigrishya Viveka. Some of you may have already seen uh, some of the talks which I gave on Drigrishya Viveka. So what's it all about? One great, the, maybe the greatest project of our civilization since most ancient times has been this quest for um, spiritual realization, liberation. So many terms are there. Moksha, Mukti, Nirvana, Kaivalya, Apavagga is another ancient word. Multiple words are there. From not just Vedic Hinduism, but um, Jainism, Buddhism. There were other sects which have disappeared now over time, which you find mentioned in when you read the lives of uh, or the stories of Buddha and Mahavira and others. So all of this, it was a civilization. It has been a civilizational endeavor. What is this endeavor? That uh, is there any deep solution to the human problem? We are all looking for fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness. We are all looking to overcome suffering. And is there any solution to it? Or you just have to manage this way and then die after a few years later. That's it. And the, um, you know, Unanimous answer from the most ancient times in Indian civilization is that, yes, there is a solution. There is a solution. And if you find that, if you realize that, uh, and it's always a spiritual solution. If you realize that spiritual solution, you will find the goal of your life. We will find deep, lasting peace, happiness. We will be able to overcome our suffering in a deep exist existential way. In which way we will all discuss this? Answers have been many, but broadly this is the answer. Yes, the answer is positive. Yes. Up to the question, the answer is positive. What is the aim of all this? What we are trying to do? In Vedanta, it is said to be Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti Paramananda Pratishya. Complete cessation of sorrow, overcoming of sorrow and suffering, and an attainment of Deep, lasting fulfillment, happiness, satisfaction, tripti. Nowadays they use the term wellness, but in the deepest sense possible. And this is the claim. And this is not just the claim of uh, Advaita Vedanta or Dhridhishya Vedaka, it's the claim of all various streams of spirituality which have come through uh, from most ancient times in India. And in different language, different stories, it is the claim of religion throughout the world. So, this is the uh, background. What we are trying to achieve here is our civilizational project. Every religion does that, but India peculiarly so, from the most ancient times till today. Now, so I am starting from the biggest picture and then narrowing it down. Swami Vivekananda, the way he would, he loved to put it in the United States here also, mm -hmm. when he went to the West also. What is this spirituality? What is Swami Vivekananda's take on this spirituality? One way he loved to do that was to quote from the Upanishads. He would say, Srinvantu Vishwe Amitasya Putra Aye Dhamani Dibhyani Tastu Vedaham Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varnam Tamasapparasta Tameva Viditva Ati Vrityu Meti Nanya Pantha Vidyate Ayanaya. You have often heard this. What does this mean? 
So he's quoting some unknown uh, Upanishadic Rishi who stands up and says, maybe 5,000 years ago on the bank of the Saraswati or somewhere, Listen, ye children of immortal bliss, is addressing us, Amritasya Putrana, children of immortality. And that itself is significant because the one thing we know, whether you are spiritual, non spiritual, atheistic, skeptic, ancient, modern, whatever we are, one thing we know is we are mortal. We are going to die. All of us we are going to die. So that's one thing we know. And the teacher just, you know, and the teacher just flat out contradicts this. The teacher says, flat out contradicted. And how so? And he goes on to say that even the gods in the heavens, if there are devatas in heaven, they also don't know this message. What is this message? Vedaham Purusham Mahantam. I have realized one infinite being. Some infinite being is there, Purusham Mahantam, I have realized that. What's it like? Aditya Varnam, blazing forth like the sun, not with the material light, with, not with the light of nuclear fusion, huh? uh, but with the light of consciousness, or consciousness with the metaphor of light. Um, forever beyond darkness. Tamasa Parasta, beyond darkness means beyond the darkness of limitation, of misery, of suffering, of death, of all kinds of sorrows, beyond darkness. And if you realize this truth, what's the result of this quest? The result is Tameva Viditva, knowing this truth, one goes beyond death. Ati Mrityu maybe. Any other way? Any other way is there? There is no other deep solution to this problem. You can extend your lifespan. You can live physically, live longer. Not as doctors say we can live much longer, but we can't tell you how to live better. <laughs> that you have to know. Um, so this is the claim. Dukkha nivritti ananda prapti. Now, background to this. There is a Vedic background to this. In broadly, our civilization has come from the Vedas. And if you look at the Vedas, there are broadly two parts to it. One part is concerned with rites and rituals, karma kanda. And the goal of those rites and rituals was that if you perform these rituals, these yajyas, your desires will be fulfilled. Whatever we have desires in this world, another world, in this world I'll be happy, I'll, I'll be wealthy, my, my children will be happy, um, society will be prosperous, and things will be nice, and after death, things will be even more nice. I'll go to such and such heaven, multiple heavens are available, you'll go there and have a great time of it all. So this is one way of overcoming suffering. Right? Try to make our externals, our life better and better. So, And religion promises that. This is called Karma Kanda. The Karma Kanda of the Vedas is sort of obsolete now. Um, most people don't, although in Hinduism nothing really goes out of style. Uh, so some form of rituals will always be there. Homa will be there, you know, you know, Hindu pujas. If nothing else in the Hindu puja, you will see a lamp has been lit. And so scholars say this is a, it is coming from the Vedic fires. So it's still there. Now, it is not that that kind of religion has gone out of uh, out of fashion. It is the most popular kind of religion. In India, in Hinduism, in every religion and across the world, throughout time. The most popular kind of religion is, somehow my desires will be fulfilled. I want uh, certain things in this world which I think will make me happy, uh, which I think will overcome my sorrow, my, my suffering. And I want God's help for it. So that I put it this way. We want God for our life. Nothing wrong in it. Majority of religions like that. If you go to a village um, festival here. The last village when you come up here to Mahavati. If you go to a huge Kumbha Mela. If you go to a great Tita Sthana. You know like in Tirupati or anywhere. And if you go to the West to the big churches. Everywhere. People are not there for Dhritrishya Vivi. Not at all. They will run away if you offer that. They are not there for Advaita Vedanta. So they will run away if you offer that. They are there for something else. They are not even there for God. They are not there for Narayana or Devi or Kali or Allah or uh, Jehovah or for Father in Heaven. No, 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 no. They are there because they want 
maybe some people want to be rich some people want a green card some people want uh, to win elections some people want uh, to whatever you want the whole range of human wants behind it is all the search for fulfillment basically and religion does promise that every religion promises that that's mass religion and that's what we are not we are not about here not just advaita ashram the whole of the ramakrishna order any kind of what i call spirituality or higher religion how will you distinguish spirituality and higher religion from uh, i don't want to say lower religion or mass religion let us say general religion how will you distinguish i put it this way i say there is one which is god for my life other one is my life for god one is that i want religious or spiritual ways of fulfilling my material wants it need not be anything very gross it could just be and we have seen it in all in our families always we have we have had this at least this this prayer to the lord let things go well let people be happy in my family myself my community people let things go well why not what's what's wrong with that prayer nothing wrong with it but remember we're still using spirituality god for this world for this community for this person so god for my life that is conventional religion higher religion spirituality is my life for god it is not that i want to use god to improve what i think necessary improvements upgrades in my life no rather i want to use my life for the pursuit of god realization whatever that is so that is the concern of the other part of the vedas called jnana kanda there are texts called upanishads so vedanta is upanishads what i'm doing in this right now is going from the biggest picture narrowing it down whole range of religion then narrow it down to spirituality the higher religion and in the vedic context it's upanishads not karma kanda and these upanishads are what are called vedanta in fact the definition of vedanta which we memorize when we brahmacharis study vedanta sa upanishad vedanta nama upanishad pramana the sources of spiritual knowledge called upanishads are vedanta this is literally it's vedanta so that is one way of looking at what we are going to do we are going to do vedanta next i want to introduce based on these upanishads based on the vedanta and sometimes in opposition to it multiple paths of the spiritual pursuit developed and these are represented by the various darshanas so this is the word which is um, which is corresponding to philosophy so the western term philosophy philosophy is philosophy a love of wisdom uh darshana literally it means exactly what it means in sanskrit and in all indian languages to see to see to experience some higher or ultimate reality that is darshana to see interestingly in the west there is a term theory theory and theory if you go back to its cognates i think it's latin or greek roots theos and orao which means Uh, to experience the higher reality literally the same meaning as darshan <laughs> I, i did not think about this when we studied in training center uh, nirod babu taught us western philosophy he would say distinguish this is mara this is not darshan and darshan is actually realizing some spiritual truth in indian philosophy western philosophy is about thinking philosophy or love of wisdom uh, but here it's not like that but then later i realized it is like that theory has the same root meaning as darshan anyway now let me enter the field of darshan very quickly big picture from vedic and there are some sources which are non vedic in ancient india arose a, a proliferation of these darshanas so one way of classifying indian philosophy darshana is uh, the so called 12 system six systems a more expanded version 12 systems shada darshan or dwadasha darshan six systems of philosophy and 12 systems of philosophy what are they you know nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga purva mimamsa and uttara mimamsa here you can see the vedic effect uh, purva mimamsa and uttara mimamsa purva mimamsa is uh, the uh, system which yes which interprets the karma kanda part of it so in today's world language the conventional religion uh, what we might say in hindi puja part 
and the uttara mimamsa vedanta is the based on upanishads the jnana kanda but not just these there was a one system which completely rejected all of this the materialistic system lokayata well lokayata charvaka materialistic system and multiple uh, philosophers were there then there are the four schools of buddhism and all of jainism clubbed into one school so jaina darshana and then the four schools of buddhism traditionally which we take sotrantika vaibhashika uh, yogachara vigyanavada um, shunyavada madhyamaka shunyavada so now you have 12 systems nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga purva mimamsa uttara mimamsa which is vedanta and then uh, charvaka jaina and the four schools of buddhist philosophy uh, shotrantika vaibhashika vigyanavada shunyavada this is one way of classifying there are other ways you, you might say that some are left out the tantric schools have been left out kashmiri shaivism has been left out anyway in all of this focus now zoom in on vedanta vedanta is the philosophy based on the upanishads multiple systems of vedanta schools of vedanta have emerged so basically vedanta is rooted in upanishads associated text is brahma sutras which um reflects on upanishads issues rising out of upanishadic study are resolved in brahma sutras and then there is of course the bhagavad gita if you want one text out of all of this a vast vast literature if you want one text to represent hinduism that would of course be bhagavad gita today uh, it's the one most popular text uh, text representative of hinduism in um, vedanta therefore the scriptural textual basis if you ask what is vedanta textually speaking it is the upanishads collection of texts then there is the brahma sutras then there is the um, bhagavad gita you zoom in particularly on the brahma sutras the brahma sutras multiple commentaries have been written later on multiple commentaries have been written on the upanishad multiple commentaries on brahma sutras multiple commentaries on bhagavad gita and these commentaries have led to the formation of distinct schools all we here have to be careful because in each of these schools if you see the tradition they will claim it goes all the way back to bhagavan narayana has given each of these schools it's not with the commentaries that the schools came into existence they were sort of formalized with the real writing of the commentaries but they all say ah, it shankara is not the founder of advaita vedanta Ramanuja is not the founder of Vishishta Advaita, but the a very important stage in the development of these darshanas took place with the writing of the commentaries. So Adi Shankara Acharya comes and writes Upanishad commentaries, maybe ten Upanishads, some say eleven Upanishads if we include Shweta Shwetar, um, and then he writes Bhagavad Gita commentary. But crucially, as far as darshana philosophy is concerned, Brahma Sutra Bhashya. Ramanuja comes and writes commentaries on this. What are the what's the meaning of these commentaries? They give interpretations of these Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita and the Brahma Sutra, and this leads to the consolidation of various schools of Vedanta. All I'm doing, remember, I'm narrowing down from the biggest picture, civilizational picture, down to our book, which we are going to start tomorrow. So now we have these various schools of Vedanta. Specifically, where did these schools arise? Specifically, we want to point out where exactly these schools textually where they differ. That one text you would look for are the various commentaries on the Brahma Sutras. So, Shankara Acharya's commentary on the Brahma Sutras called Brahma Sutra Bhashya or Shari Raka Mimamsa Bhashya. This commentary is the philosophical foundation of the Advaita Vedanta system, which we are going to study. But similarly, there is the Shri Bhashya. which is the philosophical foundation of the vishishta advaita system and there is the um, uh, bhashya of uh, uh, of uh, madhvacharya which is the philosophical foundation of the um, the dvaita vedanta system there is the bhashya of vallabhacharya for the uh, shuddha advaita system there is the bhashya of uh, nimbarkacharya for the dvaita advaita system there is even the bhashya of uh, 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 the Govinda Bhashya, which is the philosophical basis for the um, the Achintya Veda Veda system. You know, you have you no know, evidence in the West is even more popular. Iskon, uh, so the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. So these are all various schools of authentic schools of Vedanta. 
narrow it further down. We are interested in Advaita Vedanta. Okay. Adi Shankaracharya was very crucial in this, and you have a wonderful write up in your kit which you have got. Bhagavan Sri Shankaracharya. So his uh, primary contribution is the Bhashyakala. In fact, in here in the Himalayas, when you go to traditional uh, schools study Vedanta, you will often hear Bhagavan Bhashyakala or Bhashyakala Bhagavan, referring to Adi Shankaracharya. Apart from the Bhashya commentary on the uh, Brahma Sutra, apart from the commentaries on Upanishads, apart from the commentary on Bhagavad Gita, he wrote numerous independent texts. Independent means, see, in Upanishad, he is not independent. He has to explain Upanishad. In Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Sutra is not independent. He has to explain those texts. But there are certain other texts which he wrote independently, famously. Uh, a little controversy also, Vivek Chudamani. But traditionally, Vivek Chudamani is attributed to Adi Shankaracharya. Atma Bodha, then Upadesha Sahasri, uh, so multiple texts he wrote. And this became a tradition among his uh, followers, post Shankara Dvaitins. Um, they wrote many big and small introductory texts. Some were, some introdu introduce us to the whole system of Vedanta. Like Vedanta Sara, which we study as Navis Brahmacharis. Some introduce us to one aspect of Vedanta. Some are dialectical in nature, which uh, engage in fierce debate with uh, detractors or those who attack uh, Advaita Vedanta. So, in Advaita Vedanta tradition, there is a vast literature of these texts called manuals or introductory texts in Sanskrit called Prakarana Granthas. One such text we are going to study. Prakarana Grantha, um, called Drik Drishya Viveka. Uh, it is, we don't know exactly who wrote it, but probably Vidyalanya Swami, who lived about 600 years ago in the south of India, in Karnataka, which is now uh, in a part which, it's a big Vijayanagar empire, which included part of Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka. Uh, so, Krishna Devaraya, we have all heard these names. So Vidyanya Swami and Sringeri falls in that area. Vidyanya Swami was there. He is most famously known for his book uh, Panchadashi. This is a nice introduction to this text which you are, I hope you have, have you all got the book? Yeah. You have all got the book. Swami Nikhilanti has given the introduction where he says either Vidyanya Swami or Vidyanya Swami's guru, Bharati Tita. Uh, he, he wrote this book probably uh, from the style and the date, the approximate placing of the book is probably there. Uh, work. I like it. So often I start my teaching of Vedanta with this text. Um, one reason is it gets to the point directly. The very first shloka is the most important. It's, it's literally the entry into Advaita Vedanta. Okay. This is, this is now we are focused on um, the text itself. You know the background. Drigdrisha Viveka is a Prakarana Grantha among many Prakarana texts. Um, and it belongs to a school of Advaita Vedanta. Um, just a little, one insight I would like to share with you, and then we will wrap up and we'll take it up tomorrow. We'll start the text tomorrow. It's important to appreciate how Advaita is radically different from other approaches to spirituality. It is unique in its approach to spirituality. What is this approach? It's called the method of inquiry, vichar. It's important to raise this issue because um, we are, we already, we are all spiritual seekers, that's why we are here. So we are all used to spirituality, we are acquainted with it. And unless somebody flags this, points this out to us, we will not take it seriously, we will we'll miss it. And then there is a chance of confusion later on. See, one way to point out what Advaita does, the method of Advaita, unique method of Advaita, is to sh tell us what it is not. Distinguish it from, remember it's not a criticism of anything else, but just to distinguish this, what we will do from tomorrow onwards, to distinguish it from what it is not. So one way of uh, being spiritual is devotional. There is God, Narayana, Devi, uh, Shiva, Jehovah, Allah, Father in heaven, God exists. And how do you know? Faith, Vishwas, belief. Our tradition tells us, great mystics have experienced God, scripture tells us, religion tells us, so God exists. That is one way. 
And what do you do there? You have faith in God. You love God, worship God. And you chant, repeat mantras, do ritualistic worship, pray to God. So this is one type of spirituality. Very genuine spirituality. It's called Bhakti. But this is not Advaita. Advaita is different. It's not a matter of believing something. This problem with belief one, one knows. Suppose someone says I don't believe. Suppose someone says I don't believe. Then, then that path will not start for you. Bhakti path cannot start without faith. Shraddha. Vishwas. Shraddha is the foundation of Bhakti. You have to start with that. You can't start by being saying that I am, uh, if somebody says, believe in Krishna, uh, here is the mantra. Uh, I don't believe in Krishna. Tell me next. You can't start. <laughs> then there is another path, which is the path of experience, Anubhava. Swami Vivekananda, he said, can I see God? And this is the path which he stressed. First thing he did in America was in Vedanta Society of New York. He translated and commented upon Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Gave his own commentary and it's still very valuable commentary till today. Raja Yoga. This was published from there. So it says that you don't have to believe. You will, you have to go on experience. Uh, you sit in this way, breathe in this way, pull your mind back, concentrate in this way. And in through those meditative experience, meditative practices, you will get special experience called Samadhi. In various kinds of experiences you will get that will prove to you the truth of the claims of religion. That God exists, you can see God. Or you have, a, you are not the body, not the mind, you are this consciousness, that you can experience for yourself. And Vivekananda, he, he, he said, if God exists, I should be able to see God. If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it. In America, again and again, he said, religion is not believing in, a, in books. It is, religion is realization. Okay. So that is another very valuable way of being spiritual. And that, that has become more and more popular, I think, especially due to Vivekananda afterwards. Now, many of the new age approaches, they're all about uh, some kind of extraordinary you know, vision, experience. Nowadays, Vivekananda said meditation, now they say medication through, through <laughs> drugs. <laughs> so, and drugs will also give you some experience. Now, but what experience? It is a special experience. These are called mystical experiences when they are genuine, not drug induced or hallucination or um, some kind of um, neurological problem, but genuine experiences. And mystics have been there throughout history who had extraordinary experiences which are life transforming, life transforming. But there also there is a problem. If you want to find problems, there is a problem. The problem is it can be doubted. Sri Ramakrishna, in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you will see he is seeing Sri he is seeing Ma, he is talking to Divine Mother. And there is a description. Sri Ramakrishna is there, the description is there. But if you notice one thing about the description, only Sri Ramakrishna is seeing it, nobody else is seeing it. So, uh, it can be doubted and it has been doubted. What is the normal reaction to be, of people to mystics? Usually first reaction would be a man. Even Sri Ramakrishna was regarded as mad, the mad priest of Dakshinishan. Throughout history, people have generally reacted to mystics as first of all a mad person, a crazy person. Today nobody will say that. It's not. Uh, politically correct to call anybody mad. There's a new term for it. It's called neurodiverse. <laughs> so if you say I'm experiencing Mark Alio, you're neurodiverse. <laughs> but no. One can doubt it. People people get mystical experiences through uh, through uh, drugs. It's very popular in US, you know. I use the camp. And uh, then what not? LSD. And researchers are using it. There is another one which is very popular. Psilocybin? Psilocybin, yes. That's very popular now. But uh, what are they getting? Extraordinary experiences. And maybe to them it proves something. A, neuro, a neuroscientist might say that, look, because of the effect of this drug, or because you have a stroke somewhere, or because of some problem, you are experiencing such things, some light you are seeing, some vision, that does not mean you are seeing God. Because the effect of this drug on your neurons. How do you answer that? 
It could be a genuine experience. It could also be actually just a drug induced. Who knows? Now, in contrast to all of this, what Advaita Vedanta says is very interesting. There's no need to believe. No need to believe in it. In fact, if you say, I believe, you are Drashta, you are limitless, pure consciousness, Brahman, and you say, I believe you. You are very nice, I believe you. Then Advaita will not work for you. It's like trying to go into a class, a mathematics or a physics class, uh, and a professor says something, writes down an equation, and says, do you get it? You say, I don't get it, but sir, I believe you. Since you are saying you, I believe you. <laughs> that will not work. The professor will say, you have to understand it. You have to take it apart and see how it works and get it. That's the whole point. Advaita Vedanta says, not believe, like the bhakti approaches. You have to understand it, you have to get it. It also does not say that you do these practices, 10, 20, 30 years later, you will get some sudden experience and then you are realized. Not even that. Advaita Vedanta says, not believe, not extraordinary experience, not trying to generate some new experiences, rather on the most common experience which we all have. Sabko hai which we all have, every human being has, why human beings, every conscious being, sentient being has. Using those experiences and logic, we will undertake a process of inquiry. Advaita Vedanta says, you are Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. You are not a body, you are limitless existence. You are not a mind, you are limitless consciousness. You are not uh, in pursuit of little uh, joys and trying to avoid little sorrows or great sorrows. Rather, you are limitless bliss. And this we already are. Uh, Advaita Vedanta, it has the advantage of being, um, it is, you are able to express it in single sentence. That's the beauty of Advaita. You can express it in a single sentence. It's so elegant. All of this Advaitic literature, no matter what book you read, Dhridrisha, Viveka, Brahma Sutra, Vashya, whatever you read, you can put in one sentence. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Jeeva Brahma Jeeva Nabara. There is one non-dual reality, existence, consciousness, please. And this word is an appearance of that reality. That's the claim. And more devastating claim, what is that non-dual reality, Brahman? You. You are that non-dual reality, Brahman. What is even more stunning is, it's saying it's already a fact. It has always been a fact. <coughs> now, if it's already a fact, then why don't I know it? This is because of ignorance. It's another way of saying you just don't know it. You just don't see it. You just don't realize it. One way of saying what is, you know, approaching, understanding what the uniqueness of Advaita Vedanta is, you ask what is the spiritual journey here? In devotional approaches, the spiritual journey is from one place to another or one time to another. Not here in heaven, in Vaikuntha, in Ramakrishna Loka, in Kailasha, in um, you know, Janna, somewhere. Buddhism. They don't believe in God but they believe in heaven. Pure land Buddhism. In the pure land. Not here but there. Spiritual journey then? From here to there. Journey in space. Or not now, then. After death. Time. Journey in time. In America, sometimes you see these big boards put up by uh, Christian churches. After death, you will see God. No, it's all right. And then below it will be written, call 1800 something, get some dollar you have to give, and then they will tell you about God, what you will see after death. But what is in interesting for me is that word after. It's a time word. Not now, after. After death, after the Messiah comes, after this, after the millennium, after something. After time, journey from now to then, or journey from here to there, in heaven. Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta spiritual journey is not a journey in time, it's not a journey in space. I mean, what is a journey? It's not even a journey in object, that means something else other than you, you will get. See, yoga, yoga depends on experience, not this experience, that experience. Not just sitting and talking. Samadhi. So journey from this experience to that experience. But Advaita Vedanta says the journey is just from ignorance to knowledge. In Advaita Vedanta, the spiritual journey is from ignorance to knowledge. You don't have to go anywhere. You can. You want to go to heaven, you will find the same Brahman. Why take all that trouble? Here. You don't have to wait. It can be now. 
And you don't need anything else apart from yourself. So space, time, object, desha kala vastu. You don't have a journey in desha kala vastu. You have a journey from avidya to vidya. From ajnana to jnana. And ajnana to jnana, from ignorance to knowledge, the connecting link always, as always, is, all, is inquiry. Any kind of thing. When is the bell going for dinner? What is there for uh, dinner? Menu, if you want. It's inquiry, you're asking. Our Bhandari Mars can tell you. Google, inquiry. Whatever you want, you ask Google. It's inquiry. And what, you, what will you get from inquiry? It will not take you to Vaikuntha. <laughs> it will not take you, you know, across time and space. And it will not make a, a Shiva or Kali appear before you. Come <coughs> object. Why could this uh, inquiry can only give us knowledge? You can ask this question. See, a person who is devotional says God is in heaven. Now that person is safe. You say, why, why don't I see your God? Because God is in heaven. When you go to heaven, you will see. But if I say it is right now, right here, and not only that, it is you, you have a right to ask, then why don't I experience it? You are saying, I am Brahman, Jiva, Brahmeva, Napara. Why don't I experience it? Answer is, is even more devastating. You are experiencing it. I see. No, I am not. No, you are experiencing it, but you don't see it. You don't get it. So, an inquiry into our already available experience, that is Vedanta. Directly available. That's the beauty of Vedanta. You don't have to wait for one second. It's instantaneous. And all you need is that realization, oh, it is effortless also. That is the attraction of Vedanta. Can you, do you want to become enlightened Brahma Jnani? Yes. And effortlessly, just like that? Yes. And just now? Yes. Advaita Vedanta is for you. Of course, the fine print is there. <laughs> <laughs> then why did we have to come all the way to Mayavati? <laughs> why does it take year after year after year, maybe lifetimes? The fine print is there. Looking conditions, what terms and conditions apply? So terms and conditions apply is the plan thing. Alright, so this is the background, this is the text we will take up and this is the process we will follow which is inquiry. The whole thing is inquiry. At any point if you say, so this part I don't get it, so I can believe it. No, you have to get it. Make an effort to get it, what is being said. Good, let's leave it here.